uh, to the official UN Environment Assembly 5.2 side event that is being hosted by the Partnership for Action on Green Economy, or PAGE, as we refer to it. My name is Nozipo Shabalala, and it is an absolute privilege for me to serve you as your moderator today. Now, the theme that we're focusing on today is really from recovery to transformation, greening economies for people and planet. And so today is going to be about showcasing global modeling, showcasing best practices of economic recovery with the intent to really inspire accelerated action on using recovery uh, spending for addressing economic and environmental challenges together. And so we've got an excellent lineup of voices in the time that we have together. Um, those voices include uh, Ignition Keynote Insights, they include a stellar panel, and of course they include you. So as you would know, as you were registering for today, we sent you as part of that registration process, um, a, a few questions and many of you have responded. And so I'm going to be pulling in some of those responses into the conversation, but over and above that, we're also encouraging you to send us your questions and send us your comments in the chat. And we'll try to the best of our ability to integrate your voice into the conversation. I do also want to bring to your attention that we have all the amazing bios of all the speakers that are going to be um, uh, uh, sharing today. And so I encourage you, you to please uh, make use of those bios, go to the page uh, platform on the website and get a hold of those bios. I'm going to keep it really short, concise, and to the point when I introduce everyone. For those of you who are following us on YouTube, we are, of course, streaming onto the IC, uh, ITC ILO YouTube channel. And for those of you who are looking to amplify this conversation on social media, we're really encouraging that. And the hashtags that we are using is UNEA-5.2. Uh, we're also using hashtag green economy and hashtag green recovery. Let's let the world know what are the key sound bites and insights coming out of this all important conversation. I do want to extend a special welcome to those who are joining us from Nairobi. And so you might see someone in the room in Nairobi. I know that we are spread out in a truly global conversation and it is early morning for some who have joined us. Please feel free to follow the proceedings uh, in either English, Spanish or French and make sure that you are part of this conversation. Now to extend the official welcoming remarks, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Mr. Asad Nakvi. He is the head of the PAGE Secretariat and I yield the floor to him now. Thank you, Nozi. And um, what a privilege it is to, to welcome all the high level delegates, uh, honorable ministers, uh, our colleagues and friends from the finance sector, from civil society. I'm so excited, I'm so privileged. So a warm welcome on behalf of PAGE to all of you and being with us in this journey. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging that yes, we understand that the world is going through very difficult times because of Corona, uh, because of COVID and because of many conflicts, but we are coming together today to number one, express our solidarity and sympathy with all those who are affected but also to acknowledge and showcase the efforts of those partners, countries, governments, civil society, which have taken a proactive decision to make the economic recovery from COVID-19 more inclusive, more just, more fair, more green, more nature positive, and, and basically finance it. You know, the world still stands at a crossroad today. It's, it's in our hands that we can make the economic recovery from COVID that can amplify the challenges and risks to human prosperity, or that can mitigate it as we go forward. I think we have today the countries who have taken the lead in making sure that we are minimizing those risks and we align our economies and economic recovery with the SDGs, with the climate neutrality and with the nature positive agenda. Today, uh, we are launching the 2021 PAGE Annual Report. And we are so proud to be a humble partner of so many countries who have taken this decision to go green and align economies with the social and sustainability agendas of the world. So what we have done mainly in 2021, 
we were able to bring, this is something new in 2020, we were able to bring the economic expertise of UN system together to provide coherent support for accelerating economic transformation that is aligned with SDGs, that is aligned with climate neutrality agenda. We were able to accelerate our green recovery response program, which would not have been possible without the financial support of Germany, but also the intellectual leadership of the UN system and our funding partners. And we were able to bring, as we bring the five UN agencies together, we were able to bring increasing number of ministries from different partner countries, which is just so crucial if we want to take the economic transformation agenda forward. I was just looking at the numbers and so far we have worked with 240 ministries and institutions from the government to bring the whole of the government behind the economic transformation agenda. We are working increasingly more with the finance sector and we are very pleased to see EIB today on this panel. But the two things which really informed the efforts in 2021, one you will be hearing today, which was the global modeling that how a green recovery versus a business usual recovery will look like. And number two, tracking the expenditures that whatever economic recovery expenditures are happening, how much of those can be tagged as green. And the picture is probably one which can still be improved, but there are good, good, good news has started to come in. There is increasing attention to a green economy. Going forward, we have a plan. We have a plan for 2030. So PAGE has a strategy which goes from now and goes till 2030. And we will be continuing to work with many of you. But before closing, and I will not like to take more time because there is so much of exciting uh, insights that we would like to hear about. It All of this would not have been possible, number one, without the support of our UN partners, without the support of partners from civil society and private sector, but most importantly, without the support of our funding partners. Germany is here on the panel today representing our funding partners, but apart from Germany, we, we are supported by Finland, by Norway, uh, by Sweden, by Switzerland, by UAE, by Korea, and the European Commission. I hope I've not missed anyone. So thank you so much for joining us today. It will be a pleasure, number one, to hear from you. Number two, this is just a start of the event today, but we look forward to working with you towards the Stockholm Plus 50, where we hope to have a ministerial level conversation on how to accelerate the means of implementation and take the talk to the action. So here we show you a video, which is about the page highlights for 2021. And then it's over to Nizifo to lead us through the conversations. Back over to you. And please, the video of 2021 highlights.
Thank you so much, Asad. Thank you so much. And what a beautiful way to launch uh, the, uh, to, of course, to launch the 2021 annual report. As you might see, ladies and gentlemen, the link is in the chat right now. So if you do want to get access to that report, it's a beautiful uh, audio visual capturing the journey of 2021, but also projecting forward in terms of what to expect, not only in 2022, but certainly as the strategy leads us to 20. 30. What I heard Assad uh, reminding us of is the importance of all hands on deck as we look uh, to minimize the risks uh, faced by people and planet. A whole of society approach uh, rooted in a whole of government approach with the UN system in play, with the finance sector, with civil society, and with funding partners increasing as we continue to journey. With that, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure now to introduce a short framing video statement that has been shared with us by the UNDP administrator, Mr. Kim Steiner. I'd like to bring your attention to his message now. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, it is a privilege to join this event hosted by the Partnership for Action on the Green Economy during this critical United Nations Environment Assembly. Our world faces a triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature loss and toxic pollution. Yet in many ways, countries and the global community already have many of the solutions to these challenges in the form of green economy policies and tools. We must now use UNEA and the 50th anniversary of the United Nations Environment Programme as a springboard to spur countries to fully integrate these policies and tools into their systems to drive forward a historic green transformation. In this respect, I would like to highlight three key areas where I believe PAGE has an increasingly important role to play. Policy and planning and investments. First on policy, there is a growing collective will to build forward better towards an inclusive global green economy with inspiring policies and action on the ground. However, there is a pressing need for PAGE and others to assist governments realize a more profound shift in policy thinking and culture. In particular, the pulse of the socioeconomic recovery must beat in tandem with our natural world. To this end, all countries and especially key entities like ministries of finance must also reassess what economic progress actually means. They must take an integrated approach that takes the protection of species and ecosystems, climate action, low pollution measures, as well as wider green economy principles fully into account. This will help countries to recognize the true value of nature, which holds many of the answers we need to address the climate crisis and indeed to achieve the global goals. Second, on planning. We need to strengthen incentives that catalyze a nature-positive future for people and planet. This includes preparing for a clean and just energy transition that will bring power to hospitals, schools and businesses while preventing the dangerous heating of our planet. PAGE and its partners have a vital role to play in helping countries to plan this accelerated energy transition, including in regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, which is home to 75% of the world's population without access to electricity. Indeed, with this know-how and strategic investment, Africa has the potential to leapfrog towards clean energy sources and systems. At the same time, countries need support to lay out bold ambitions in other key areas. That includes setting the conditions for the sustainable food systems of the future, for instance. Indeed, in both the energy and agriculture sectors, countries need evidence-based advice on how to reform and repurpose farming and fossil fuel subsidies in a progressive, socially just and economically fair manner. Third, on investments. Many developing countries are facing acute difficulty when it comes to accessing the finance needed to power a green recovery or transition, while others are also facing debt distress right now. Remarkably, 82 developing countries are currently classified as fiscally vulnerable in this year where we are still struggling with the fallout of the pandemic. If you add the growing challenge, rising energy and food prices, higher interest rates and supply chain issues, we are in some ways facing a perfect storm that is pushing even more people into poverty. 
We must face up to the threat of global divergence in the economic recovery between developing and developed countries, which threatens the promises of the 2030 Agenda. In short, many developing countries need rapid access to new debt relief measures and financing. In tandem, green economy approaches can help countries to make the right investments now in physical and digital infrastructures to deliver the future they want, including better health, new green jobs and increased resilience in the face of the next crisis that we know will come. This involves bridging the gap between short-term aid and long-term economic planning so that the root causes of climate change and biodiversity and ecosystem loss and poverty can be overcome once and for all. Many countries also need tailored assistance to fully harness the power of digital technology and data, enabling them to make the critical connections that drive forward the global environmental and sustainable development agenda. And there is clear need to deepen public, private sector and civil society partnerships that catalyze green financing. This includes scaling up innovative debt for nature and debt for climate swaps, as well as performance-based green and blue bonds. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, at this pivotal moment for people and planet, countries and communities are looking to define or redefine a new development pathway in the wake of this devastating pandemic. The success and speed of change depends on the choices that countries make today. PAGE and similar green economy initiatives are serving a critical function, providing countries with evidence-based policy options and pinpointing best practice. We do not always have to reinvent the wheel. This is helping them to make the choices that will speed up progress on the global goals and lay the foundations for the sustainable, prosperous and green economies of tomorrow. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, and that, of course, was the UNDP administrator, Mr. Akim Steiner. And the call to action is loud and clear. Countries and communities are calling for a new development pathway. And if we're going to see a speed in change, that is going to be informed by the decisions and the choices we make today. And certainly giving us a beautiful framework, looking at policy planning and investment as we as we transition now into our next segment in our program. We are now going to have the opportunity to be ignited uh, by two speakers. They're going to be showing some keynote insights. And at the core is the question that Asad uh, had already referred to. And the question is, of course, green recovery versus business as usual. Um, I'm going to be introducing our panelists a little bit later, but in the interim, our panelists are going to be listening into these keynote insights as well, as they might want uh, to make some comments and have some reflections uh, on what we are about to hear. We've got two speakers coming up, so I'm going to introduce them both. I'm going to introduce Professor Margaret uh, Chitiga Mabugu. Uh, she is the Dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the University University of Pretoria in South Africa. And in her work, she's mainly interested in analyzing the impact of policies on society and the economy at large. And she has collaborated with Page and Cambridge Economic, Economic, Econometrics on the recovery modeling exercise in South Africa. And that, of course, leads me to the introduction of the gentleman on your screen right now, uh, Mr. Richard Looney. He is the chair of Cambridge Econometrics uh, and some of his uh, recent projects uh, that he has directed have included modeling uh, inclusive green economy policy scenarios in the context of COVID-19 and the recovery plans, including, of course, the South African example that I've just cited, and he's done this for UNEP uh, and ILO through PAGE. So we're all listening keenly uh, to these keynote insights. We're looking forward to be ignited. And of course, to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, use the Q&A function on the chat function if you have any questions or comments, and we'll try to the best of our ability to bring them in when we go into the panel. For now, let me hand over to uh, Professor uh, Chitiga Mabuga, as well as Richard Looney. Uh, Professor, I'm not seeing her on screen right now, so I'm going to invite Mr. Richard Looney to kick us off, and then as soon as she is on, this, uh, on again, um, I will invite her to take the floor. Richard, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Nazi. 
Let's hope Margaret's back soon. Um, so we know the context, right? We know uh, environmental degradation proceeding apace, a whole host of indicators, especially global warming. We had the warning, uh, the update yesterday from the IPCC about the impact of that. We know also that the commitments made and the actions carried out so far by governments are just not ambitious enough. It seems that uh, we collectively as society, we respond with urgency when there's a crisis today, but not, we don't do so well with dealing with the steady gradual deterioration uh, with an impact that will be felt by mostly by generations not yet born. We're not so good at that because we had a major economic crisis driven by the pandemic and governments and central banks were suddenly forced to adopt fiscal and monetary policies previously thought crazy, printing money, running deficits on a scale not normally seen in peacetime. It became mainstream to think, well, if you're going to make these massive interventions to support the economy, why not use them to make the kind of investments we need to accelerate the transition to a green economy and build back better or build forward better? But even before the crisis in Ukraine erupted, from where I sit, it seemed that that priority was already starting to slip. The global economy was seeing some recovery from the GDP fall seen during the last two years. Macroeconomic policy turning back to conventional concerns about inflation and public debt. Uh, build back better seemed to be losing its resonance and opponents were raising fears that green economy measures will raise prices further by pushing up the cost of energy. And I have to say, in my view at least, um, many economists haven't helped because they've assumed, not proved, they've assumed that a green economy must be less efficient and more costly than the brown economy we're stuck in. So the story has been, okay, maybe we do need to curb the greenhouse gas emissions and take other uh, measures to mitigate the impact on the environment, but that's going to hurt economic growth. It's going to hurt jobs and living standards. And well, if that's the advice you're getting, it takes a brave government to make this its priority. But what we find in our economic modeling is that in all but the, the most fossil fuel dependent countries, investing in the green economy offers multiple benefits, a net gain in GDP and jobs, a stimulus to innovation that will reduce costs and drive long-term growth, and mitigation of environmental degradation that of course threatens long-term prosperity, and improved energy security that helps insulate economies against the spikes in global fossil fuel prices of the kind we're seeing right now. Well, if that's true, what are the obstacles? And clearly financing is a major issue. We need to be making major investments in physical capital like renewable power, electricity grid infrastructure, battery storage, energy efficient buildings. Uh, as Margaret's going to say, um, in South Africa's economic reconstruction and recovery plan, there's a heavy reliance on leveraging private investment. The state can't do it all. It needs to foster the conditions that will make investment opportunities attractive to the private sector. So that's one obstacle, finance. But here's another. Even though we've seen great progress in cutting the costs of the key technologies, there are some technical challenges that still look difficult. Decarbonizing air travel, managing peaks in energy demand, capturing carbon emissions. But I think the biggest obstacle is not the financing one or the technical one, but social and political, because it's not much comfort to know that tr the transition will create more jobs than are lost if yours is one of the jobs that's going to be lost. And that would offer fertile ground for populist politics. So it's not just about environmental policy. It's not just about macroeconomics. We've got to have policies to support workers and communities to adapt to and benefit from the new opportunities, you know, both for the sake of natural justice and to build political support for the transition. We won't succeed in building a green economy if it isn't an inclusive green economy. Well, I'm a, an economic modeler, so here are two key messages from our, our modeling. First, a green economy offers some real win-win-win opportunities for growth, 
jobs, energy, and the environment. Second, we need to act now to help people adapt to the shift out of the fossil fuel age, or else our societies will face still greater inequality and polarization, and the transition will probably be derailed. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard Looney, and uh, those key messages coming through so strongly. It's a win, 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 win if we take the pathway of the green economy and also the urgency um, to act now. Um, those obstacles that you're highlighting for us and a reminder that financing is an obstacle and we'll hear that. But more importantly, how do we build social and political support? Because that's how you drive change and that's how you shift entire societies. Thank you very much for that. So Professor, um, Professor Margaret, I see you are back with us. Let me give you the floor, Madam. As we have, as we listen into your keynote ignition, uh, green recovery versus business as usual. What do you have to share with us? Thank you very much, Nozi. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to share the work that we have done uh, under the leadership of Richard Leone, uh, together working with uh, researchers from uh, Cambridge Econometrics, with myself as well from the University of Pretoria, as well as in partnership and collaboration with UNEP, UNEP, ILO, and of course, PAGE. I have some slides which I assume will be shared. Apologies for the glitch that had happened on my side. So next slide, please. The idea with the, this kind of modeling was really to use a quantitative modeling framework that informs policy in terms of what really happens to our economy as we recover from COVID-19, particularly comparing and understanding the impact of non-green policies, so in brackets, let's call them brown, brown policies versus green policies, and then just tracking indicators on the economy, GDP, on social, that is employment, unemployment, and therefore, and also on the environment. Uh, this was an energy economy environment a model that belongs to Cambridge Econometrics. Next slide, please. In South Africa, we were, of course, very privileged that we had very specific policies that had been announced by the president in a um, um, last, last uh, 2020, actually October 2020, the economic reconstruction and recovery plan to, to understand and to, to give impetus to the economy to recover after uh, uh, COVID. There were many different strategies and policies there. Uh, I will not go into the details here, but we, what we did is we separated the sort of conventional policies or non-green policies from green policies, including a, a very big emphasis on public works as well. Just notice that the budgets are different for the different uh, impetus. A is conventional policies where we look at infrastructure, localization and so on and funding there, uh, relying very much on the assumption that most of the funding would come from private sectors. It's 835 billion and then public works, which is a short term uh, um, strategy for, 20, for five years, uh, amounting to 68 billion, then green elements, particularly focusing on the energy sector, trying to understand if we were to subsidize renewables, if we were to uh, invest in grid and so on, to the tune of uh, in the neighborhood of 190 billion over 10 years, what would happen? But then we also had a green push. This is outside of the recovery plan, asking what if the, the government were to be even more ambitious and add another 300 billion into this funding. The results that we got are extremely important. Again, remember that I said we were comparing just to see, next slide please, uh, GDP in, in impacts, that is economic impact, social impact, that is employment, unemployment, and then of course the environment, looking particularly CO2 emissions. So if I start in the top um, uh, corner there, left corner, just uh, for, for orientation, that dotted line on top on the zero is just business as usual, so, so that we can compare the results. The, the black dotted line is simply what would happen with COVID without recovery. So conventional policies clearly lift us uh, to a position that's better than without any, any policies. That's the blue line, the A. If you add it to that uh, public works, again, we see an even re better recovery in terms of GDP. If you add green uh, elements, we are moving more and more towards that zero line, the, the line that we would have been at if we had not had COVID, the business as usual. But if you pushed 
further than now that's including what's not in the policy that a forest green line you see that we reach a business as usual much faster so so green policies not only are also contributing to growth in terms of employment unemployment we see a mirror of, of uh, actually what happens with GDP, uh, these policies lead to an increase in net jobs. And what's very important is that green policies also make a huge contribution to net jobs. Okay, that's very important. In between these two, uh, at the bottom now, employment and unemployment, you see that we also show what's happening in the sectors. And it's clear that extractive sectors would suffer because of course, this is why the coal and other things are happening. So it's important to have that conversation that was mentioned several times the just transition you mustn't leave anyone behind if i go up to the top left hand corner there just to, to see what's happening to co2 emissions you can see that if we did not have green elements in our growth we quickly go back to uh, emissions that are uh, in line with what would have happened with uh, before covid that is not good we increase uh, environmental degradation. But green policies, and particularly the green push, pushes us very close to the commitments that South Africa has made in terms of its emissions. So, so just three big messages that are coming out of this work. Number one, the next slide, please. Uh, using conventional policies, yes, allows us to grow our economies, allows us, us to improve in terms of uh, reducing unemployment, but they quickly lead us to environmental degradation. Number Two, uh, there is a big opportunity for South Africa to really be very bold and go green. And, and we know that this means that we not only in, increase uh, GDP, not only reduce unemployment, but we, we uh, uh, contribute towards reduction in environmental degradation. And number three, that conversation about a just transition is absolutely critical to this kind of a, a green a strategy, green policy. Thank you very much, Nancy. My finger's not as fast uh, there. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Margaret. And of course, I'm looking at the people on the screen as you're presenting. My eyes are on uh, Minister Creasy, who we know is in Nairobi. I see a lot of nodding as you're speaking. I'm looking at the other uh, faces as well. So there seems to be quite an energy around the, the work that's been done in terms of the modeling that really speaks to the business case to say, it cannot be business as usual. So we're really hearing that urgency coming through. But to the the point that I think, uh, Richard, you were making earlier on, the opportunity uh, for these data-driven, um, uh, for data-driven advice. In fact, I think it was um, Mr. Akim Steiner speaking about data-driven uh, policy guidance. And this is really what we're hearing coming through from this uh, modeling exercise in South Africa. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I do not doubt that our panelists uh, will have an opportunity or might want to make a comment or reflect on some of what we've heard from yourself, Richard, and uh, yourself, Margaret. Thank you very much for that. Now, unfortunately, the time is so tight that we don't have an opportunity to pause and, and engage in a conversation. But you know, um, if, if there is a question that comes from the audience, please pop it into the chat. And if I still have Margaret or Richard, I will try and put, them, put that question to them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we did say that we wanted to hear your voice in this conversation. So we asked you, as part of our registration process, you, our global audience, to share your perspective on the following question. We said, how could your country emerge greener, more sustainable, and more inclusive from the pandemic? What you're going to see on your screen now is a quick snapshot of just some of the responses that we got from around the world. And I just want to bring these into the virtual room from us. Uh, BIM uh, Adhikari in Canada says, we need to increase financing for renewable energy in the global south. Uh, Aliandra Lopez uh, from Guatemala is saying, we need to focus on forming strategic alliances between the private sector and communities in order to link local production to solid markets. In Nigeria, Ifeanyi uh, Onyere was saying to, in response, by committing more resources to renewable energy, by powering primary health, care, uh, health centers to improve healthcare in rural communities. And so bringing it right back uh, into, uh, into the Nigerian context. Up uh, um, in Switzerland, Chris Hopkins was saying to us, what we need to be focusing on is deeper green conditionality in recovery funds. And so we 
really also beginning to see that investment nuance coming through. Uh, Reza Oktaniato in uh, Indonesia says, green policy in economic resilience brings the real sustainability recovery from COVID-19 crisis. And I think that's really well put in the context of the conversation. Uh, in Kenya uh, and not far from where um, Dr. Hurst and, and Minister Chrissy are right now, um, Kevin Kanyura uh, says COVID-19 restrictions on movement have seen the digital space for trade expand, including agriculture, benefiting our farmers. The question then becomes, of course, how do we do more of that and how do we accelerate uh, more of that? And then in the Philippines, Norlene A is saying, scaling up climate action through nature-based solutions in cities through people-centered and all of society approaches. And again, that resonates so strongly with some of the earlier comments uh, that we heard are uh, being shared by Assad. So I do want to say thank you all of you to those who sent through questions. This is just a short snapshot um, and we received many, many of these. Ladies and gentlemen, we're moving now to our panel discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists who are going to switch their cameras on so we can all see them. I'm gonna start off in Nairobi because there's two people in the room. And I'm going to introduce Her Excellency Barbara Creasy, who is the Minister of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment in South Africa. Minister, good afternoon to you. Uh, thank you for being here. And of course, the minister is in the room uh, with Dr. Christopher Hurst. He's the Director General uh, for, the, for the Projects Directorate at the European Investment Bank. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hurst, for being uh, with us. And so we look forward to your lens on the investment conversation. I'd like to extend a welcome to His Excellency, um, Vice Minister for Industry, Energy and Mining in Uruguay, His Excellency Walter Berry. Um, thank you very much, Your Excellency, for being here with us. Dr. Bettina Hoffman is with us. She is, of course, the Parliamentarian State Secretary in the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation, Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection uh, in Germany. And so we're looking forward to hearing and learning from the German experience um, and why uh, Germany has really put its weight um, behind uh, a green recovery for all. And then, of course, uh, if you're seeing on my screen is Madame Michaela Freiberg's story. She is a UN resident coordinator in Kazakhstan. Madame, thank you very much. We're looking forward to hearing uh, some of the work um, in collaboration with PAGE that's taking place in Kazakhstan. And also uh, is Madame Christine Umutoni. She is the UN resident coordinator in Mauritius. Thank you for being with us. And it was beautiful to see both Kazakhstan and Mauritius in that video uh, that Assad introduced to us. And so we, we're keen to hear uh, from the both of you. So Minister Creasy, Maybe let me start off with you because we've just heard from Professor Margaret and we're picking up on the South African uh, uh, case study. I would like, Minister, if you want to make, if you'd like to make a comment on what you've heard to give you the opportunity to do so, but perhaps you maybe start off with this question. Which policy areas in South Africa is South Africa fo focusing on specifically to link green recovery to long-term economic transformation, especially in line with and supportive of the Sustainable Development Goals. To you, Minister. Well, I think obviously um, we, we have a situation in our country where on the one hand, we have extensive unemployment, poverty and inequality that has been significantly deepened by the COVID-19 pandemic. On the other hand, we have a situation of energy poverty. Uh, we have a, um, a gap of about uh, 4,000 megawatts in electricity generation. And I think that as we consider our journey from a high carbon environment to a low carbon economy and uh, a climate resilient society, we see an opportunity to enhance energy security in the country and to make energy more affordable and more accessible to ordinary South Africans. Of course, what this does is it poses us the significant issue that was raised by Richard in his, in his input about climate justice. Um, we have 88,000 high quality jobs in the coal value chain in our country. 
we have a situation where 88% of our electricity is currently generated by coal-fired power stations. Now, in a situation of high poverty, high inequality, high unemployment, there has to be a very careful and a very conscious way in which you are going to make the necessary transitions to a lower carbon economy. We are very clear as the South African government that workers and communities in the coal value chain and in the coal producing regions of Mpumalanga cannot carry the burden of the transition to a, a low carbon economy. And we've spoken a lot about the financial needs for investment in new technology. In my view, that will happen automatically. What we have to concern ourselves about is where will the financing come from to ensure that workers in the current coal value chain are reskilled and upskilled? And how will we ensure that we begin a very conscious process of developing new upstream and downstream industries in those communities where we where ESCOM, uh, our energy generator, is planning to repurpose coal-fired power stations, either with renewables and gas. Uh, we've done some research um, in uh, four of the communities that uh, where, where coal-fired power stations are um, scheduled for decommissioning over the next uh, few years. And what we found is that um, with reskilling and repurposing, we can avoid direct job losses. If we want to ensure that there are no indirect job losses, <laughs> but more importantly, if we want to ensure that there are new jobs, then we have to look at the conscious reformulation of new industries in, in those areas. And I think that, that, that that is really the fundamental challenge that we face as a developing country. And it, it is those financial needs that are not easy because they're not directly linked to the revenue streams that would arise from new forms of, of energy generation. And I think that's the fundamental issue that we need to be considering in this conversation. Minister Creasy, thank you very much for a very comprehensive response, but the one that invites us into the complexity um, of uh, really um, uh, accelerating a green recovery on the ground and you've giving us the lens and the nuance of a developing country and speaking about uh, the complexity of having the triple challenge of poverty, inequality and unemployment, yet at the same time um, alive uh, to the need to transition towards a green economy to look at more secure, more affordable and more accessible energy sources. And to do that with the communities um, and the workers in mind who at this moment are still dependent uh, on some of those coal fired, uh, those, uh, those coal sources in the form of ESCOM employment and ESCOM of course in the community. Thank you for that because I think it brings nuance into the conversation. Let me then make my way to um, the Vice Minister, uh, Vice Minister uh, Barry. Let me come to you sir with, uh, with, the next, uh, with the next question. And the question that I'd like to bring uh, to you, your excellency is, how is Uruguay linking green recovery to long-term economic transformation? Again, in line with the SDGs, but might I also ask you, Your Excellency, to comment on the role of the circular economy in Uruguay's green transition? Over to you, sir. Ahora sí, buen día. Eh, para mí un gusto, en nombre del gobierno de Uruguay, eh, poder participar en este distinguido evento. Así que bueno, eh, vamos a tratar de responder la pregunta que usted nos ha hecho. Ustedes saben que Uruguay tiene una economía que es basada en la producción primaria de bienes, básicamente agrícola, ganadera y forestal, que desarrolla en forma amigable con el medio ambiente y con el cuidado de los recursos naturales, teniendo una muy fuerte legislación de protección del ambiente. Uruguay vincula a la recuperación verde, como usted me preguntaba, con un desarrollo económico 
alineado con la Agenda 2030 y con los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible que como país hemos asumido el compromiso de, 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 de llevar adelante. Con una perspectiva de mediano y largo plazo, eh, aunque teniendo en cuenta que se debe dar respuesta a las urgencias que en estos momentos nos ha ocasionado y nos ocasiona aún la crisis provocada por la pandemia, como han dicho otros expositores. En relación a las perspectivas a largo plazo, yo le diría que las mismas apuntan a eliminar el uso de los combustibles fósiles como primer y gran objetivo, como fuente de energía, sobre todo del transporte y en lo posible también de la industria, orientando lo que nosotros llamamos la segunda transición energética, migrando hacia la movilidad eléctrica, tanto para el transporte urbano y enfocando el desarrollo en, en, de otras fuentes de energía como el hidrógeno verde, por ejemplo, Uruguay está muy bien posicionado para generar hidrógeno verde y estamos trabajando en un proyecto piloto que tendremos funcionando en breve en nuestro país. La meta de lograr la transformación de la, de la matriz energética hacia fuentes renovables, la, la primera transición energética, se logró con éxito y determina que en la actualidad el 97% del suministro de energía eléctrica de nuestro país, prácticamente la totalidad, es generado por fuentes renovables, convencionales y no convencionales. En el plano social es destacada la posición que ocupa el país en el ranking de índice de desarrollo humano estando entre los mejores de América Latina y el Caribe. Eh, eh, contamos con un acceso universal de la población a las tecnologías de la información y las comunicaciones y acceso a Internet. En el corto plazo, el desafío se orienta a mejorar las condiciones de emprendedores pequeños y medianos, en especial de aquellos sectores que la economía, que han sido muy castigados por la pandemia, a través sobre todo de incentivos hacia la incorporación de tecnologías o a lograr soluciones innovadoras. Otro de los desafíos planteados se refiere a la digitalización, en especial a la consolidación de la industria 4.0 y la creación de un centro tecnológico de bioeconomía circular que impulse la investigación, el desarrollo y la innovación. Eh, la estrategia climática de largo plazo elaborada y puesta en marcha desde el año pasado en conjunto con el Ministerio de Ambiente y el Ministerio de Ganadería, Agricultura y Pesca de nuestro país, y el ministerio al cual eh, tengo el gusto de dirigir, eh, se, se, se propone un desarrollo económico que tiene muy en cuenta el cuidado ambiental en la lucha contra el cambio climático, enfocado en la disminución de las emisiones de los gases de efecto invernadero. La adhesión de la, a la coalición de economía circular de América Latina y el Caribe, eh, que Uruguay ha hecho, se espera brinde nuevas oportunidades de intercambio y colaboración entre países, la transición hacia la economía circular es un desafío encarado por el país. Realizamos hace cuatro años el primer foro de economía circular de América Latina y el proyecto PACE de Naciones Unidas consolida esta apuesta, impulsando el paradigma de la economía verde e inclusive. Para terminar, en breve, el Ministerio de Industria que dirijo ejecutará un proyecto seleccionado por el Fondo Conjunto de las ODS de las Naciones Unidas, orientado a potenciar la segunda transición energética en el país. Como verá, son muchos los desafíos que tenemos por delante. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Minister, uh, for a very comprehensive response again. Uh, speaking, of course, to some of the immediate um, responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also spending quite some time sharing with us some of the long-term um, responses, including a long-term climate strategy. You've spoken about the energy transition um, and of course the place of the circular economy as an enabler of that strategy. Thank you very much. And, and I, um, I would imagine there might be quite a number of questions in relation to that. I'm coming to Dr. Bettina Hoffman next with the question, but before I do, I just want to acknowledge the comment from Raul Lopez, um, where Raul was saying to us in the chat, it's very important to ensure that we don't displace employees. How do we do that? And if we were listening in to Minister Creasy talking about um, paying attention to both the direct and the indirect job losses, paying attention to uh, the opportunity for the creation of new jobs through new industries and unlocking opportunities upstream and downstream. So I certainly think um, that uh, a lot of that has begun to come through in the conversation, but Raul, thank you very much uh, for your question that had come through in the chat. Dr. Hoffman, 
what is the experience uh, of Germany with the green recovery? If you could comment on that, but I'm also keen to hear your voice on what do you think of the findings of the modeling exercise, especially as it relates to your own domestic and international efforts, Dr. Hoffman. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, I am delighted to be with you here today and I thank Paige for organizing this Seedside event. Germany is convinced that economic recovery from COVID-19 crisis must pave the way to a more sustainable future. The findings of the study presented here today underline the potential of green recovery for building resilient economies. I firmly believe that the result of this work can provide inspiration worldwide. My ministry has been supporting PAGE since 2013. It was particularly impressive to see how quickly and effectively PAGE reacted to the new challenges of the pandemic. Germany pleased to support these PAGE activities with additional funding from the German COVID economic recovery package. In Germany and the EU, we decided to dedicate a substantial part of our national COVID-19 economic recovery packages to climate action. This includes investing in our national hydrogen strategy, increased funding for the federal building modernization program, supporting a bonus for the purchase of electric vehicles, boosting public transports. Through our international climate initiative, we have launched a 68 million euro package to support sustainable recovery measures in 25 countries. Greening our economy will remain a key task for the, uh, in the future too. And it is made all the more urgent by Russia's war on aggression on Ukraine in violation of international law. It's essential that we eliminate our dependence on fossil resources in order to improve the supply security of our national economy. To this end, Germany will invest massively in the expansion of renewable energies. During the G7 presidency, Germany will drive the green transition forward. We have made strong alliances for a sustainable planet and setting the course of the economic stability and transformation, the first two major goals of our G7 presidency. Dr. Hoffman, thank you very much. And so what we're hearing is one, an affirmation and a commitment uh, to continue investing and supporting. Um, you're talking about the extension of that renewable program and extension to do more, but also um, you started off by saying um, one of the one of the aspirations is to be an inspiration worldwide in terms of what is possible. And we're certainly tuning into that, looking, watching closely, learning closely from what Germany is doing. And I don't doubt that there's a lot of contextualizing uh, that other countries are taking from the work that Germany is doing. Let me go to Nairobi now. And I wanna go to Christopher, uh, Dr. Christopher Hurst in, uh, in, in Nairobi. Uh, Christopher, we've heard quite a bit of um, comments around financing and the financing challenge. Um, the question to you is, which investment shifts do you think are going to be critical to ensure that we have a sustained green recovery? Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this, in this panel. I mean, we've, we've heard already of the, the, the multiple crises that we face, the, the combination of climate, environment, I think the social crisis of the and unequitable impact of of these crises on, 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 the, on the poor. Um, it's clear we need urgent action. We need urgent action in the coming decade if we're going to tackle these, 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 these crises and they're not going to over, over, overwhelm us. And as we saw earlier in the, in the grass from Margaret, that this should be a decade of recovery and growth. So it is important in this time to consider what investments are needed in, in, at this, this, this time. Of course, this is a, a complex question because we're facing many different sectors with different features, different timelines to what can and cannot be done. So it is, it, it is a very complex question. So, the, but the question, I, I guess, is, is what, what has the EIB done about this? Um, well, first, one thing we've done is to put climate as our, and environment as our, as our top priorities to guide what we're doing. 
And we've also asked the question for all of the projects that we fund, are they Paris aligned or not? And that means, are they, are they consistent with the target of reaching uh, net zero emissions by, by 2050 or not? And we've come up with a set of technical criteria that allow us to judge these different these these these, these different investments, which includes for our part no 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 funding of fossil fuels from, from from now on. We've also defined what is green, which is important to mobilise finance for those projects. So you need a set of criteria so that you're not can be uh, accused of greenwashing washing in this process. But what is also important is to ask what is the people who are borrowing from you, who are a bank lending money, doing. And do they have an overall strategy which is consistent? So, I mean, to put a, a simple example, putting a windmill on top of a coal mine is not a, is not a sustainable project. So the, the question is, is what are the borrowers doing? And so we're asking borrowers to consider these questions and to have strategies. And we're very much uh, aligned with the disclosure objectives of the European Union, where we put transparency on the, the social, uh, the ESG uh, policies and procedures of our borrowers, that these should be shared with, 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 with the, the public. For biodiversity, we shifted from having an objective which was one of, of no net loss to, 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 to no loss, which is an important change. So I think what you have to do is, is build up sets of criteria at the, at the, for, for each different sector, each different project level about what is acceptable or not, and to also see what's Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've just uh, momentarily lost Nairobi there, but I do believe that they're going to be up in a second. So I'm going to um, I'm going to pick up with them in a moment. But just to just to recap some of the comments from uh, uh, Dr. Hurst, which I think were really really important, um, the emphasis on being clear about the funding criteria and the extent to which that funding criteria is in line with um, the, the aspirations for a, a healthy planet and a healthy, pre, uh, a healthy people as well, the extent to which it's in line with green economy recovery. And so when we get him back, perhaps we can uh, pick up on some of those comments. Let me then go to Madame Michaela uh, Freebeck's story, who of, of course I introduced as the UN resident uh, coordinator in, in Kazakhstan. And, and, and Michaela, the question I really want to bring to you is, in your experience with PAGE, how does PAGE, as a partnership of five agencies, support a coordinated UN approach to the green, um, uh, green recovery and economic transformation efforts that are underway in Kazakh uh, Kazakhstan? Well, thank you very much for that, Nose. So let me just start then. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a true honor to be here, Excellencies. I I am very glad to see so many participating in this seminar and not least partners and colleagues. So allow me just to say that we are 27 UN agencies working in Kazakhstan and the vast majority of us have a mandate related to uh, the issues that links to, to greening the recovery of the pandemic. So PAGE really has a central role in bringing many of us together. I also think it's important to underline that Kazakhstan's economy gro economic growth is historically very based on its extractive industries. Um, we see that Kazakhstan is one of the biggest emitters of CO2 in the world in terms of emission per capita. It's also flood prone, exposed to extreme temperatures and impacted by glaciers melting uh, as well as droughts. So we are really seeing a lot of complexities around the, the, the green dimensions that we focus so much on jointly. Um, for us, uh, it's important to remember that Kazakhstan joined PAGE uh, in 2018. And since then, we have jointly worked on integrating a low carbon development into Kazakhstan's strategic vision on green economy and the, the uh, country's green economy concept. This has also allowed us to focus a lot more on the sub-national level through introducing green financing mechanisms that goes beyond the, the nationwide structures as well. Some of the key deliverers that I have seen from PAGE over these past uh, two years, where a lot of the output has come after the scoping study and the, and the uh, initial year, has been support to the low carbon development in Kazakhstan, that strategy. It's assistance to updating the national green economy concept, 
support to Kazakhstan's new environmental code, the Green Kazakhstan National Project, and using fiscal instruments to support green SMEs and, and employment. But I would really like to also underline some of the issues that relate specifically to the pandemic, because when the pandemic hit for Kazakhstan, not only was it this very uh, urgent and unprecedented unprecedented healthcare uh, threat, but it was also the fact that we saw a dramatic fall in the price of oil. It went down to something like 30 to 40. I think that we had a low point in April uh, 2020. And that is the key source for the internal revenue. So that it became the sort of a very hard economic hit towards the, the, the country as well. That really led to a downturn for the uh, for the um, an economic downturn in the country and a decline in the real income of the people. So I think it is absolutely essential to look at how we also used PAGE when we responded, not only to the pandemic as it related to the healthcare, but also from a social economic dimension. So we had a social economic response group as part of the overall UN response led by UNDP. So hats off to colleagues in UNDP. And in there, the, the ideas and work from PAGE was a, a, a clear asset that was also integrated. PAGE focused on informing the government's economic recovery plan and working with key line ministries in the Green Economic Council. And the result of the COVID-19 social economic assessment really indicated to us the importance to build back greener, okay? Better means greener, without a doubt. And here, let me say that it's also clear for the government that this is where we're heading. And I really want to underline that. Having said that, what we also see is that the commitments made are also linked to politics. And I know that we are a little bit short of time, but let me just say a few words because many of you will possibly also have followed what has happened in Kazakhstan at the beginning of the year with uh, some pretty strong um, unrest around the country. And that started with some of the fuel prices going up. So we know that in a context that is as dependent on its, on its uh, extractive industries on fuel that are currently not renewable, we see how closely linked this is to the social cohesion and the stability of the country. And we must recognize those political challenges that go beyond what we immediately think of when we think of greening the economy. So I want to actually pick up on, on what uh, Her Excellency the Minister said earlier about reskill and upskill when we look at how we're going to transform. Because in Kazakhstan, we're looking at something like potentially some only 25,000 workers in the coal sector. But when you look at all the supply chain for the overall extractive industries, we are looking at several hundred thousand. And that's where we need, really need to make sure that PAGE thinks and supports us as the UN country team to also work on what we call being the just transition to make sure that we leave no one behind as we move forward on this. And I have to say that I really feel that, that one of the key advantages with PAGE is this grouping, uh, this, this joint program of the UN agencies that come together at the onset. Now, in the UN reform, we have this mechanism to do it from the RC uh, perspective as well, but PAGE allows us to learn globally and immediately. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michaela. And, and I think so important that uh, you're lifting the point around um, being um, conscious and tuning into those political challenges. Um, again, it is one of the key things that we heard from Richard to say, 
The financing is a challenge, but it's the political and social buy-in that potentially we need to be really tuning into. And, I, and, and, and of course, lots of alignment, what we heard from Minister Creasy. Um, Christopher, we, we lost you for a few seconds towards the end of your response. And so before I come to Madame Umutoni, I just want to make sure that we, we've got the end of your contribution. You were talking, you were asking, you were sharing with us how part of the work is about asking even the borrowers, what are they doing with the funds that they are accessing and being very clear about the funding criteria um, as a way of really contributing to green economic recovery. Is there anything else that I've missed that you had wanted to say um, as, as, a, as a conclusion to your response? No, I think that was the main point. I'm not sure where it, it, it dropped off, but the main point I think is to take this view, not only of for each individual investment, is it part of the solution or part of the problem, but then also for each individual economic agent with which we're dealing, are they part of the solution or part of the problem? And, and clearly we should be doing projects that are part of the solution with people who are also part of the solution. So that, I think that's the main message that this really requires a detailed analysis of each individual investment and each individual economic agent, company, bank, whomever. And we and, and we we're, we're, we're very much uh, believe in disclosure and transparency by the partners we have that they should be uh, disclosing what they what their uh, ESG standards are, what their ESG procedures are, and how they implement them. And that disclosure is is a tremendous force for people also to move in the same direction because everybody can see exactly what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, uh, that uh, point on transparency and alignment and visibility um, that allows for that momentum, Christopher, is certainly what I'm hearing. So allow me then to go to um, uh, Madame Christine Umutoni um, in uh, the UN uh, Resident Coordinator in Mauritius. Madame, a very similar question to what I had put uh, to, to uh, Madame Michaela. Um, again, focusing on, um, on, on PAGE and in particular how PAGE is supporting a coordinated UN approach to the green recovery and uh, transformation uh, efforts that are underway in Mauritius. What uh, insights might you be able to share with us there? Madam, you're muted, so we're not, can you kindly please unmute yourself? Thank Sorry, you. Sorry, muted. Um, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on this panel, uh, this high level panel. Um, very rich conversations that uh, we are getting here. Uh, I think I should be in Nairobi, but for some reason I was not able to get access. It's a huge meeting, but I think I should be sitting on that table where the ministers are, but good that we are able to connect this way quickly. I know we, we, ha we don't have much time. And uh, what I should say, uh, I agree with my, my colleague, um, the RC in Kazakhstan that to understand the importance of age is important to look at the context in which we are operating so you see the value. So if I take Mauritius and Seychelles, small islands, high income, uh, graduated in high income, uh, from the onset, and we had page before even COVID, the fact that uh, Page was able to bring together all these agencies and so to say the ministries and Ali alone helped to do a Marshall Plan against poverty, knowing that, you know, looking ahead and saying that being upper middle income, high income doesn't mean you dealt away with poverty. Actually, sometimes it's depending on GDP, but it's not about human development. So um, Page was able to do a whole Marshall Plan against poverty and create what we call the social registry. I'll come back to that because when COVID hit, it is this social registry that helped us to identify who needs what. So, but also um, uh, Page has helped on many things, including um, green financing, because there was a whole lot of research on uh, now we have started implementing the green bonds and the blue bonds uh, thanks to this kind of research that was done already. 
Uh, also, the, the, the very many assessments, you know, even um, modeling jobs. For example, you know, many other crises have been hitting um, Mauritius, for example, during the Wakasho oil spill where the fishermen lost all their job, but quickly the ministry in charge of agriculture from the experience from, uh, from Page was able to look into uh, uh, turning these people into agriculture, you know, looking completely the other way and allowing, so to say, to not deplete the fish, the little fish that had been hit by the oil spill, but go into the other side of agriculture, changing their skills. So what I should say in a nutshell uh, is that Page has brought a culture of inclusive green evolution, I should say, even before we had COVID. So that when COVID came, what Page has done is to change the thinking. It was like a catalyst. And these are not very so a lot of resources, but there are those resources that are used catalytically to drive thinking and changing and thinking green. So now when COVID came, already the, ex and, and even helped in us in the UN reform, because again, for Mauritius and Seychelles, high income agencies, some of them closed office because there's no resources coming, uh, difficult to coordinate because then uh, uh, everybody was, but through the experience with page where you do something, five, six agencies together and um, uh, do uh, analysis together, it, it has helped the government because now we have, for example, steering committee that brings the different ministries together to think together. And in, in that case, um, for, for example, the recent resources that we got from German, we, 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 we focused on what, is, what, is, uh, what are the key problems facing the island now and focused on um, uh, agriculture and tourism. Yeah. Where now we are looking into green, uh, uh, green agriculture, smart agriculture. And uh, just to demonstrate how uh, networking among ministries now the Ministry of Agriculture is able to speak with the Ministry of Energy and find solutions on how to empower the, uh, uh, the farmers. And because COVID sort of brought to surface what Page has always been saying uh, um, uh, to the extent that uh, already it, it was shown that um, we don't have, we don't produce locally, we don't have enough to sustain this thing. But now uh, COVID brought everything to the surface. So it yeah. was easy again to, to bring the, the, the notion of working together to now uh, look, the focus is now on how to produce locally. So yeah. anyway, in, in, conclusion, in conclusion, I would say that um, Paige has really uh, helped, we've built on that. And now other, other clusters have come. You know, we have a cluster on disaster. We have a cluster on food systems. We have a cluster on different, but the idea of clustering is coming from the example of a successful story. And lastly, now it has propelled us into a whole dynamic of systems thinking. And now we are going to start long-term planning beyond recovery. So now through a, a, we could say we copying pasting from page through a systems thinking to, to, to provide solution, but that interrelated and interlinked. I think I could stop there. There's quite a lot I could say on, on page. Uh, it's we really uh, are privileged to have been a page country. Madame Mutoni, I think it's an it's, it's an excellent uh, contribution, and you know, again, bringing in that nuance between not making the mistake of thinking high income equals no, low poverty um, and the impacts of the Marshall Plan. But more interestingly, um, you speak about a culture of inclusion uh, that has been ushered in through this coordinated approach, lifting the thinking to a systems thinking level, and that really being the, the catalyst that moves us from uh, recovery to transformation.
question. We're running out of time, but what I do want to do is I just want to um, ask a few questions and with some short, sharp responses. And I want to maybe go to His Excellency Vice Minister very first. Um, Your Excellency, in, in, in just a minute, how is the collaboration with PAGE supporting uh, the government's green economy and sustainability objectives? Just a comment on the on the relationship with Paige, please. Eh, bueno, Paige ha sido sin duda un socio estratégico para nuestro país, eh, muy importante, al cual eh, lo resaltamos, lo valoramos y queremos continuar con él. Page eh, ha contribuido desde ya hace unos cuantos años, al, desde el 2017 podemos decir, al diseño de las políticas eh, nacionales de economía verde, incluyendo el Plan Nacional de Economía Circular y el Plan de Gestión de Residuos que estamos instrumentando. Eh, Page también ha impulsado la medición de estadísticas nacionales y subnacionales de economía verde, inclusiva y empleo verde en el país, ha creado oportunidades para que las cadenas de valor tengan en cuenta la circularidad de los productos y materiales, realizando un máximo aprovechamiento de ellos, estimulando el fortalecimiento de enfoques de producción y diseño, impulsando la innovación y la investigación, a fin de terminar, en definitiva, aportando, colaborando con el sector empresarial. Eh, PACE también ha desarrollado un plan de, de creación de capacidades que ha priorizado el trabajo con cuatro públicos, eh, con cuatro públicos eh, objetivos, digamos, los gobiernos subnacionales, la sociedad civil, el sector público y el sector privado. En los cuatro ámbitos se han implementado cursos y talleres que fortalecieron las capacidades en la materia del desarrollo sostenible y la economía circular entre otras dimensiones. Es importante destacar que, porque es, porque es bueno saber cómo funcionó en nuestro país, eh, que PACE Uruguay ha priorizado siempre el trabajo conjunto y articulado entre las cinco agencias de la ONU y los cinco ministerios que son implementadores a nivel nacional. Si bien el, 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 el foco referencial para el país lo tenemos nosotros en el Ministerio de Industria, Energía y Minería, el que tengo el gusto de liderar, de todas formas, hemos priorizado la, la armonización con todos los demás ministerios y con todas las agencias de Naciones Unidas. Un ejemplo de ello, por ejemplo, es el curso para gobiernos subnacionales sobre economía verde e inclusiva, eh, tanto para el diseño como para la implementación. Eh, y allí tenemos cuatro agencias de, de Naciones Unidas, UNITAR, ONUDI, PNUD y PENUMA. Y cuatro ministerios o agencias nacionales, el Ministerio de Industria, como decíamos, el Ministerio de Ambiente, la Oficina de Planeamiento y Presupuesto que tiene rango ministerial y la Agencia Uruguaya de Cooperación Internacional que depende de otro ministerio, pero que también participó en esto. Eh, todos ellos trabajaron conjuntamente y participaron activamente en la ejecución. Y no es el único ejemplo, obviamente. La relevancia de PEICH en Uruguay es incuestionable. Ha realizado un ejercicio de articulación, de movilización de recursos, de generación de capacidades que ha derramado a nivel nacional y subnacional. Ha puesto en la agenda la economía verde y ha marcado un rumbo para eh, la construcción de las políticas en, en la materia. Desde el gobierno nacional se tiene, como decía, mucho interés en continuar el trabajo de la economía verde inclusiva y obviamente de contar con el apoyo de PACE para nosotros ha sido fundamental y lo será en el futuro en este proceso. Especialmente, eh, como fuera ya señalado, se impulsa la implementación de una política nacional de economía circular en conjunto con tres ministerios, y, y eso para nosotros es fundamental. Para finalizar, eh, expresamos nuestras coincidencias con la visión definida por los países afiliados a la coalición de economía circular de América Latina y el Caribe, en especial en el reconocimiento de que todos tienen un papel que desempeñar y que los formuladores de políticas, las empresas, los inversores, la sociedad civil, así como los ciudadanos todos, tenemos un papel y somos claves para dar vida a la transición. Así que bueno, eh, después de todo esto, para nosotros todos estos años 
que hemos trabajado con Page realmente han sido de aportes que sumaron en la dirección que el Uruguay quiere avanzar, que es la economía verde, la economía circular e inclusiva, y, y dimensionar el impacto sobre el medio ambiente. Muchas gracias. Vice Minister, thank you, thank you very much. And so we we are hearing, our, in fact, something that um, uh, Madame Mutoni spoke about. She spoke about copy and paste, but what I'm hearing is a blueprint for action, a blueprint to accelerate action, a harmonization of resources on the back of that. I do want just to acknowledge uh, that um, the executive director for UNEP, Madame Inga Anderson has joined us. She is going to be uh, closing us off and sharing her remarks. Um, and so Madame Anderson, I hope you'll bear with us. I have two quick questions that I just want to close off with. One to Minister Creasy uh, in Nairobi and um, a final one to Dr. Bettina Hoffman. And so, Minister, let, let me come to you um, just for a quick, um, a quick intervention on, on, on this one. And that's to bring the collaboration with Page into the room um, and how that is supporting uh, South Africa's green economy and sustainability objectives. If you could give me a quick comment on that, Minister. Well, I think Margaret earlier spoke about the valuable research that uh, Paige has been conducting. And I think that what it's giving us oh, is here in our for the decisions that we would want to be making. But let me leave you with a thought for future direction of the work that Paige is doing. We've spoken a lot today about the, the just transition for vulnerable workers and communities. And I think that uh, some of your contributors have started to raise the issue of how in practice we include those vulnerable workers and those vulnerable communities. In my view, if our, our transition is genuinely to be just, those workers and communities need to be involved in the design of the transition, they need to be involved in the implementation of the transition, and they need to benefit from the transition. I think it would be great if Paige could turn their attention to documenting what good practice for a just transition would look like for those who need to benefit most and who need to participate in it. Thank you very much. Minister Chrissy, thank you very much. Uh, intentional direction towards vulnerable workers and communities, <laughs> some best practice about what that looks like on the ground. Dr. Hoffman, let me wrap up the conversation by inviting you just to maybe a quick comment on how Paige is supporting Germany's uh, development cooperation objectives, please, madam. Thank you for your question. Uh, let me say at times of global crisis, uh, the benefits of partnerships and alliances are even more marked. Um, pooling the expertise and resources of different stakeholder groups and aid organizations facilitate swift, sound, and efficient uh, responses. The page activities based on the page business model, which is a joint project of the five ON organizations at the national level, are exemplary. Uh, this highlighted by the growing interest expressed by many other countries in joining the page family. And that's good, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's exactly uh, the kind of response that we're looking for. And it really affirms everything uh, that we've heard so far. Ladies and gentlemen, um, that does conclude for us um, at this panel discussion. And I really think the contributions that we've heard from our panelists have really been nuanced. They haven't shied away from the complexities. They've brought them up to the surface. But I also think they've not only reflected on what has happened, but begun to project on the possibilities moving forward. And so with that, I would like uh, to call on uh, the executive director of UNEP, Madam Inga Anderson, for her thoughts as we begin to close. Well, thank you so much. And um, I'm afraid I caught the end because we are here and I have all these distinguished ministers who are in Nairobi. And I am so very, very grateful to everyone who made the trip here. And it's wonderful to see you, Minister Creasy. Uh, and of course, to see you, Minister Berry and the other distinguished panelists who, are, who have been on this panel. 
I, I'm very, very grateful to South Africa, to Uruguay, to Germany, to Kazakhstan, Mauritius, uh, for 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 their brilliant uh, insights, and I think, and to others, and I think that what we're really seeing is that these shifts that are needed on the policy and investment side, they can be enabled by regulatory and other stimulus uh, elements. But it is very clear, and we heard that just now from Minister Creasy, that recovery, that potential for recovery that is there needs to be just. And so needs to make sure that there is an understanding that if there are quote unquote winners and losers, uh, in such a transition that we put a safety net uh, under those that may stand to lose. That does not necessarily mean that we don't make the shifts, but it does mean that we have to take them advisedly and with uh, good analysis and understanding and hearing all voices in the process, because we must tackle that triple planetary crisis, the climate, the nature loss crisis, and the pollution and waste crisis. We are seeing an increase in green, green, green share of the recovery spending, but it's going way too slow. And uh, uh, the recovery spending has been very inequitable in that some of the wealthier countries have spent uh, domestically but other developing countries did not necessarily have the resources available to pump into the economy. Although I sit here in Kenya and I am very impressed by what many of the countries on this continent, in fact, did, including our host country. Um, so I would say that's one point. The second point is that the financing, uh, as we finance this transition, for the SDGs, we really have an opportunity to realign and be very conscious and do good understanding of and good studies to understand how can we maximize job creation? How can we ensure that these jobs are decent? Um, on Sunday, I went to Dandora um, dump site. This is in the context of plastic. Speaking with the pickers, the plastic pickers, that they want to continue to have their livelihoods. So how can you transform what is very unsanitary into something that still protects these people so that in that transition, they have opportunities too. That becomes important. Now, with respect to nature, clearly, we understand that half of the global economy is dependent on nature. So, but we also understand we are not nearly investing enough into, into protecting and, and making it generate for us, in fact, uh, sort of impacts on nature, are often quote unquote externalities. And then uh, uh, the, 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 the public purse has to pick them up, whereas the, the goods, the profits are privatized. So we need to understand that the public purse cannot pick up those uh, externalities, the bads, while the private sector picks up the goods. This is the conversation that we need to have. Now, we do see that digitalization has some potentials um, because we can tap into some digital tools. We can be smarter in how we do our investments. And uh, here, UNEP FI is something that I just want to raise because the financial initiative of UNEP is really pushing the frontiers on green and sustainable investment, well knowing that um, not this doesn't happen overnight and that to make those shifts uh, is not a turn on a dime, as the Americans say. So finally, in conclusion, let me just say that if we use smart digital technologies, if we use innovative solutions, if we uh, use those historic levels of finance, albeit that they have been unevenly distributed, and if we champion this change, uh, around the world. And if we're very deliberate about not leaving anyone behind, we actually have a moment in our history where we have an opportunity to flip this towards that greener recovery. So with that, Masifo, let me just thank you so much. You're always so wonderful when you facilitate dialogues and, and a wonderful thanks to you and of course, to the ministers present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Anderson. And as you said, we have a moment in history where we can flip uh, towards a green recovery. Thank you very much for lifting 
um, a lot of uh, the very big questions that we've been grappling with as you talk about the consciousness around the winners and the losers and what is the safety net that we then put um, underneath those that are the most vulnerable as we uh, undertake a green transition and one that is a just green transition. Ladies and gentlemen, as we get to the end of our time together, allow me first to extend an apology on behalf of Ayaka Melitafa, who's a young climate activist who couldn't uh, join us today. We also ran out of time because one of the things I was looking forward to was uh, putting uh, Mr. Oliver Greenfield on the spot. He is uh, from the Green Economy Coalition. And the reason why I wanted to put him on the spot is I did see his chat uh, earlier on talking to us about the event that they're having in Nairobi today at 16.30. So let me just at the very least speak to that event. It's really going to be looking at building back greener, looking at international environmental protection and achieving the SDGs in the context of COVID-19. It is a multi-stakeholder dialogue. It is taking place at 16.30 EAT. Um, and we're going to be hearing um, the voices of member state representatives and, and other stakeholders as they together consider the lessons learned from the COVID pandemic including the push factors, so the policy requirements, but not forgetting the pull factors, the change in culture and the change in behavior that we've also be, been talking about. So please look out for that and register if you haven't. We're going to put in the link now, just some of those registration links if you're interested to join that conversation at 16.30. I'm leaving you with a short video on uh, green recovery uh, that is focused on the path to inclusive economic transformation. I do want to say a big thank you for myself and the organizing team. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be a part of this moment in history to flip towards a green and just transition. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy the video and then you will be welcome to log off. Thank you so much and goodbye. A global pandemic that brought our lives to a halt. Growing inequality that leaves many without basic necessities. And climate change that threatens the longevity of our planet. But where there is a will for change, there is opportunity. It is time to flick the green switch. We have a chance not simply to reset the world economy, but to transform it. COVID recovery and our planet's repair must be the two sides of the same coin. The benefits of a green recovery are beginning to be modeled by countries around the world, but we're still falling short on investment in sustainable change. Investing in jobs and carbon neutral economies as part of recovery today will create resilience and equality tomorrow, continuing our pursuit of the sustainable development goals. Page the United Nations Partnership for Action on Green Economy is positioned to help. Since 2012, PAGE has provided the expertise needed to build more sustainable and inclusive economies. As countries around the world have begun planning their COVID-19 recoveries, PAGE has leveraged the UN system and funding from the German government to align recovery with the SDGs. That is where I see the real value of PAGE. Because Page for quite some time now, seven years they've said, has been gathering experiences from different countries in different contexts, at different scales, at different levels of development, to develop a sense of what works, how it can be done, concrete policy suggestions based on deep and thoroughly prepared country-specific analysis to foster and promote and enable a green recovery. To date, 20 partner countries are working with Page to green their economies and many more have expressed interest in PAGE support. In Indonesia, PAGE is collaborating with government leaders to spearhead a circular economy through the Build Back Better with Low Carbon Development Initiative. Indonesia is laying the groundwork for job creation, skills development, and resource efficiency. South Africa, another PAGE partner, has been experiencing immense job losses throughout the pandemic. Leaders worked with PAGE to rapidly model the impact of the government's recovery plans. This data is helping inform the government's future economic plans and underpins South Africa's current green recovery programming. Increasingly, 
countries around the world are pursuing green recoveries to support the sustainable development goals for people, economy, and planet. However, many further efforts are needed to ensure a sustainable future. Learn more about green recovery and green inclusive economy at un-page.org.